Miller is uh, a young man that's been here many times with Brother Josh Wilson. And uh, he's been over there, and he's, he's been one of uh, Brother Wilson's disciples. And discipling is a powerful thing. And this young man has, has showed good character every time I have come across him. And I have wanted him to come down and just had never inked it to say, let's do it this time. And uh, he gave me a, I saw him at, at GMC and I said, hey, bro, you're going to have to give me a call. If I don't call you, I want you to call me. And he called me and texted me. Because he wanted to come preach for us. All right? Praise the Lord. So let's don't let him down. Anybody got an amen in their spirit tonight? Anybody going to help him carry the water? The mail tonight, bring the word of God to the church. Brother Nick, come preach for us. God bless you. Uh, like he said, I've come with Pastor Josh before, and it's always been a great time. Only this time you guys have fireworks. That's really why I wanted to come. Um, but I'm honored to be here. You guys are great people. Um, and I see you've done some renovations to the building. Looks great. Um, but thank you, Pastor Bone, for allowing me to come and uh, give honor to you and your wife. Um, and uh, like you said, uh, he, Pastor Bone's asked me many times, but I've been away at college, Urshan College in Missouri, and just never got around to it. But um, I also thank your pastor for believing in young preachers. I know how it is when you got a young guy. You don't really know what he's going to say doesn't really have a lot of experience behind him, but I, I appreciate um, him trusting me with this with this pulpit and speaking here tonight. Um, also, I have my girlfriend here, Charity, and so she she got here last minute, so there was like a pile up on the highway or something, but I um, also say hi to my mom. If your live stream is working, she's watching, so hi, mom. Um, and also, uh, Brother Andrew Bolin, I was on a call so, man, I saw a call last night about uh, camp meeting for next week. So I didn't really do much. He did all the work. I just sat there and just stared at the screen. So they're just going to have me, I guess, do whatever next week. So, uh, but tonight, I have, feel like I have a word from God. And um, if, if you will turn to your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 1. Amen. Amen. I just began to pray when your pastor um, gave me the go just to come and preach here. I want to always go into every situation with prayer, amen? Diligent prayer, amen. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And then we're going to go to John, book of John chapter 8 and verse 32. Give you a second to turn there. Praise God. The Bible says in John 8:32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. Amen. Tonight I'm just gonna preach on liberty. Liberty, pretty fitting. All right, would you set your Bibles down, lift your hands, lift your voice? And let's pray and ask God. I already feel the spirit in this house. God, I thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here. God, I pray that you would help me to deliver the word that you have given me tonight for this church. I pray that there would be deliverance here tonight. God, I lose liberty in this house in the name of Jesus. I bind every spirit of hell coming against this church, against this time together right, right now in the name of Jesus. God, I loose your liberating power in the name of Jesus Christ. Would you clap to the Lord for a moment? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Liberty is defined as the state of being free within society from oppressive restrictions imposed by authority on one's way of life, behavior, or political views. I'll say that again, paraphrasing. Liberty is defined as the state of being free within society, culture, this nation, this state, this city from oppressive restrictions. Things opposed on you, oppressive restrictions that are brought to you by those in authority. How you talk, how you walk, it affects your very behavior and your political views. 
I would say that throughout history, there has been no greater cause of war than the desire to be free. May I even say independent or self-sufficient. The United States itself was formed as a result of the American Revolution when the 13 American colonies revolted against the rule of Great Britain. America is known as a sign of freedom, as a sign of independence. However, America is not the only ones who have fought for freedom. During World War II, a woman of Indian Muslim descent by the name of Khan Noor became the first female radio operator to be sent from the UK as a spy in France. But when she was captured by the Gestapo, Hitler's soldiers, the last word she said before being shot in a concentration camp was liberté, which is French for liberty. Advocates of liberty they were, and advocates of liberty many are there in this world today. But the reality is, and I don't want to take away from this service today, the reality is, is not one country has ever obtained true freedom or true liberty. Liberty and freedom in our world today is defined as being self-sufficient, independent, and I'm speaking from a theological view. As I can do this all by myself attitude, but it seems that the condition of this world just keeps waxing worse and worse. Perhaps it is not our country who is at fault, nor our politicians. Some may think that if we just voted the right person in for office, that that would finally bring true freedom. Yeah, you may get close, but it's not complete liberty. Some may think if we only figured out a way to make everyone happy in this nation or give everybody what they wanted, that that would be true freedom. You may get close, but it's not complete liberty. It's not true freedom. It's not lasting liberty. Brothers and sisters, America, this state, this city, and this world does not need better politicians. It needs to turn back to the truth of God's word. Hallelujah. It needs to turn back to the message, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for those when we vote certain people in office. I'm thankful that Roe versus Wade was overturned. I'm thankful that they're putting prayers back in the school. Thank God for that. But if you think that that is America's saving grace, you are fooled. What is going to save America is nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I feel the liberty in this house. While this world screams independence, while this world screams freedom, the Bible says, repent. While this world takes great pride in saying, I'm self-sufficient, I can do this all on my own, Jesus said, pray, take up your cross, deny yourself, follow me. And while denominational pastors preach, say this sinner's prayer and you will be saved, the Bible says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Blackwell Pentecostal Church, I am tired of this world offering me freedom and independence that only brings a temporary reprieve. The Spirit of God was meant for more than to just lead us to an oasis every now and then. To give us an emotional reprieve. God is wanting to completely and totally deliver us from bondage. There's nothing, well, there is something you should know about your adversary today. He does not come knocking on your door in the middle of broad daylight saying, let me bring fear into your life. Because if he he did that, he knows none of us would answer that door. That is why the Bible calls the devil a serpent. He is sly. He is cunning. He is crafty. Yes, the devil is a liar. John chapter 8 and verse 44, speaking of the devil, says, When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. This is why it is absolutely imperative that we know the scripture, we read the scripture, we pray the scripture, we quote the scripture. The devil's playground are the minds and hearts of those who do not know the Bible. In fact, it was Eve who did not know the command of God in Genesis chapter 3. And for that reason was led to deception, disobedience, and ultimately a spiritual death. If you remember in Genesis chapter 2, God tells Adam, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. But if you go over a chapter later, that's when we find the serpent. The Bible says in Genesis 3 and 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. 
And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And we like to talk about that. We like to talk about, you know, it's, it's a great message. It's a great way of viewing the story that he planted that seed of doubt in her mind. And I agree with that. And I agree that that is certainly what happened here to an extent. But if we read a little bit further, we find one minor discrepancy that Eve uh, was make, or that Eve had when she re- recounted the command of God. In verse 2, it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Now, let's go back to verse 3. Eve says, God had said, You shall not eat of it, and get this, neither shall you touch it. Notice the serpent simply questioned the command of God in Eve's life, And it was actually Eve who was off by one minor discrepancy. God said, don't eat of the fruit. But Eve said, don't eat, don't touch of the fruit. God never said, don't touch the fruit. So when the serpent told Eve she wouldn't die, Eve reached up in temptation and grabbed that fruit. And guess what happened? She didn't die. Why? Because God never said, don't touch the fruit. He said, don't eat of the fruit. The devil knew this and used this against Eve and to his advantage. You may say today that touch, eat, it's all the same thing. It doesn't really matter. But brothers and sisters, the words touch and eat make all the difference when you're talking about the word of God. You may be asking, what does this have to do with liberty? What does this have to do with freedom? Well, because deception and falsehood will always lead you to bondage. It will always lead you to believe half truth and half lie. And if you believe partial truth then you always believe that you are free while simultaneously believing, while simultaneously you are still bound and not even know it. There's nothing worse than that, to think that you're okay, to think that you're safe, to think that you're free, while all the while you are still bound. In fact, it was the Jews in Jesus' day who were a prime example of this. The Bible records in the book of John, chapter 8 and verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And look at what they say in verse 33. They answered him, talking of the Jews, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? So here Jesus basically tells the Jews that they are in bondage, saying the truth shall make you free. Now, the word free there was often used by philosophers to mean free from false ideas, false passions, false perceptions. However, Judaism spoke, and Jesus spoke here, of being free from sin. Nonetheless, I know truth will deliver you from both, but in their response, the Jews say, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? They were so convinced that they were free. Because they came from Abraham. And it's ironic that they would even make this claim. Because most Jewish teachers would have at least acknowledged that they had been under some kind of oppression in the past. Under Babylon. Under Persia. Under Greece. Under Rome. It's ironic that they would even have made this claim. But simply because they came from Abraham, they believed that they were free. But listen to what Jesus responds with. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. And in 2 Peter, we read this verse, 2.19, talking of false teachers, they they promise freedom, talking of false teachers, they promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of sin and corruption. The Jews in that time would have been greatly insulted by that because their whole lives they had been taught they were free. And many sources even say that being considered a slave to them was an insult. However, their response is not too far off from many of those I have encountered in my short life. Statements made such as, well, I've been in church my whole life. You mean to tell me I'm in bondage? I've obeyed Acts 2.38. I was a Bible quizzer. My dad was a pastor. You mean to tell me I'm in bondage? Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here today. What I'm not saying is that you are in bondage. If you need deliverance, you can get it in this house today. I believe that. That's, that's between you and God. But all I'm pointing out is to never give credit to your freedom based on where you come from or how many years you've been living for the Lord. 
Your fight for freedom simply does not end at Acts 2.38. Your freedom is contingent. It's dependent upon your willingness to stay away from sin. Now, I didn't say your ability to stay away from sin. In fact, that's, my, that's the opposite of my entire point. The point is, while this world screams independence and self-sufficiency, the Bible is clear that man will never be self-sufficient. And we are not designed that way. At the end of the day, we all need God in our lives. Amen. Amen. So I'm grateful. I've been in church my whole life. I've obeyed Acts 2.38. And I'm not saying any of you are making this claim in this house today. I'm just simply telling you what I wrote down, what I feel God gave me. Acts 2.38, I'm so thankful. That is a plan of salvation. But that doesn't end the fight for freedom and liberty. As we read at the beginning, Galatians, I'll go back up here. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's not talking to people here who haven't obeyed Acts 2.38. He's talking to people that have obeyed Acts 2.38. So it's very possible that any one of us could return to that yoke of bondage. Give me a second. I'm going to get back to my notes here. The Greek concept of truth emphasized reality. But the Old Testament word of truth had to do more with integrity and faithfulness to one's word or character. This is why the Jews talked of God's truth concerning his word and the integrity of his word, that God was never going to lie. He was never going to fall shy of his promises, that he has integrity in what he said and what he promised them. That's a whole message in itself. But what this has to do with our freedom, what this has to do with liberty, is that it is not enough just to obey Acts 2.38. It's not enough just to know the truth. Sure, you may know the truth, but if that knowledge does not meet action and integrity and faithfulness, then we so easily slip back into the chains of bondage where we, we were delivered from. The epistles continually warn us to not go back to where we once came from. And if we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 22, we we read about those who were once saved but now have turned back to sin. The Bible says, for you are a slave to whatever controls you. That's powerful in itself. We think of sin, you know, the first thought that most, I would say, young people, I don't know, think of sin as sexual sin. It's like the, the worst sin in their minds. You know, but there's a lot of other sins. That's anything that controls you. That's not Christ. That, in essence, is a sin. Even the Bible says that you know, if you do something that is not of faith, that it is to you a sin. And when people escape from the wickedness of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then get tangled up and enslaved by sin again, they are worse off than before. It would be better, the Bible says, if they had never known the way to righteousness than to know it and then reject the command they were given to live a holy life. They prove the truth of this proverb, a dog returns to its vomit. And another says, a washed pig returns to the mud. As I began to pray about this service, I felt one word, and that is deliverance. I believe that God is wanting to completely and totally deliver someone in this house today. Partial deliverance is not in God's reputation. When he delivers you, he delivers you. Amen. What I'm saying here today is that staying pure in these last days and staying free from sins, oppression, and bondage is a fight and not just a one-time deal. I did not come with a somber message tonight, but I came to tell you that even if we entangle ourselves again with sin's corruption, he still has the ability, willingness, the power to set us free again and again and again. And all I'm saying is it's hard to be free when you don't have the right understanding of what freedom is. If your hope is more the voting and the right person in the White House, then God's delivering power and word, then you'll never have freedom. I believe more in the power of prayer than I do in the politicians on Capitol Hill. I am thankful they are trying to put prayer back in schools and they overturn Roe versus Wade, but that is not America's saving grace. I believe the reason that happened is because a bunch of people got together and said, we believe in the power of prayer. We believe that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And that is the reality of the matter. It is not when you get the right preacher to come to your church. It is not when you get the perfect pastor. It is when you get the Spirit of God in your life. That is when liberty begins to set in. Yeah. Praise God. Mm, I feel the Spirit here today. What I'm also telling you is that liberty does not just look like an emotional breakthrough. 
Sometimes liberty looks like being set free from concepts, ideas you have held so closely, and God teaching those things out of your mind, out of your heart, out of your spirit. It's very possible to be in church and be deceived because I was one of them. You want to know the quickest way to fall into deception? It's to fall back in sin. Because the Bible says, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. I'm not saying it's the only way to fall back in sin. I'm just saying it's one of the quickest ways to fall, in, or fall into deception. The Bible says, with all deceivableness of unrighteous, unrighteousness, they perish. Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Their deception is working with their unrighteousness. So your mind and your heart work hand in hand together. Let's read the whole excerpt here. This man will come, he's talking about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil, deception to fool those on their way to destruction. And the Bible says this, because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. And so God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Simply put, if you're wanting to live a righteous life, then you won't be satisfied believing a lie. And if you know the truth of the word of God, then you will be less susceptible to believing the lies of the enemy like Eve was. Eve, in my opinion, you know from what I read and you know the other pastors and preachers that have poured in my life, you know, it seems that Eve didn't really know the word of God. She didn't, and whether that's a fault of Adam or Eve, we won't get in that, into that debate. But clearly, it is, it is seen in the scripture that she added that one little thing to the word of God that so easily changed everything. And I'm preaching about truth. I'm preaching about this because when Jesus was speaking, he said, the truth will make you free. If you want to have liberty in your life, sometimes it's not, it doesn't look like, you know, some camp meeting, powerful Ah, you know, emotional breakthrough. Sometimes it's as simple as you just, you need God to work some ideas out of your mind that you've held closely in your heart. And I'll say that's, I'm saying this from experience. I'm saying I'm one of those guys because I grew up in a church my whole life and I went to camp meeting after camp meeting. I thought, man, if I could just go to because of the times, then I would truly get delivered from this. Whatever this was, I didn't even know what this was. It was just a thing that I felt. It was just some emotional thing. But I realized later in life it was just God trying to mature me, trying to grow me, trying to teach some things out of my spirit. And so sometimes we're not bound by a spirit. Sometimes we're not bound at all. Sometimes it's God that's working in our lives. So don't mistake God's work in your life as bondage. Sometimes it feels that way. But I'm talking about those in this message, about those you're living in sin, you've entangled yourself again with bondage, and you're saying, well, that's not possible because I have the Holy Ghost. Well, it's very possible that you can entangle yourself again in bondage. And I'm telling you that even if that is the case, God can still deliver you again and again. His mercy has not run out. His grace has not run out. I know that's cliche, but I'm telling you, if you try it, Brother Stone King always says this. He says, you know, when I tried everything else, I heard a whisper come to me that said, try me, try me. And it was Jesus calling out to him. So if you've tried everything else, why don't today, why don't you try Jesus and see what happens? Amen. So by no way am I imposing on anyone today, you're bound. You need a deliverance. If that's not you, that's not you. We pray for somebody else. But for those that I know in this house, God is wanting to speak to tonight that you've, you've entangled yourself in some things again. You can find a way out tonight. And you can repent of your sins and God will deliver you again and again. Now, don't, don't, be like, don't be like me at some point. I know I never really went through with it, but there were some times, man, where I had been to so many church services that, like, at some point I was like, what's the point? You know what I mean? Because I'm just going to cry in the altar, and I'm just going to leave, and I'm just never, I'm not going to feel, I'm just going to keep fighting Monday through Saturday. But this wasn't the answer that I wanted, but it was the right answer, and that was just to keep going. You know, I wanted a deep answer. I wanted, well, this is what you're dealing with, and this is this, and that, and this, and this is how you're going to deal with it, and that'll be it. I wanted a whole game plan, but it was as simple as, I don't know, and I got to keep going, because I know what the truth is. I don't know what's going on. I don't know necessarily what I'm feeling, but I just know that's not going to dictate my future that God has for me. 
I, I would even say that if I were to have allowed that to dictate my future, that that would be bondage. That would be bondage. So maybe you're not bound by sin, addiction, whatever, but sometimes we can be bound by ideas and concepts that this idea that I'll never get through this, I'll never come out of this, I'll always be like this, that is bondage. So I don't necessarily think the bondage I'm talking about is some major sin or addiction. Sometimes, like I said, it's ideas, it's concepts. God's got to work out of you so you can fully step into the liberty he has for you. Yeah. Amen. So... Um, I got a couple things here left. What do we do to stay free? One I have here is pray every day. I put down here one hour of prayer every morning. You know, there was a time where I didn't do that because I was like, whatever, one hour of prayer in the morning. That's just some Pentecostal tradition here about whatever. I'll just go throughout my day and pray. But really, I realized like, well, who's up at 6 a.m.? Not a lot of people. You know, so you're going to have to get all your work done during the day. So it's not really convenient to, like, take time to pray in the middle of the day when you're super busy. So what I started doing, what my pastor has pushed me to do is just go to the church every morning at 7 a.m. and pray for one hour. And, man, I'm telling you, this changed my life. In the first 14 days, I was so mad. I was, like, gripping this. I was like, this is not working. I was like, I don't feel any different. I was so mad. But after a month, after a month and a half, you know, they say it takes, like, what, 30-something days to make a habit. You know, after like a month, a month and a half, I'm telling you, like, the results were just incredible, amazing. So, number one, how do you stay free? Pray every day. You know, the Bible, we know this. The Bible talks about staying on the altar, you know, dying out to our flesh. You know, the reality is we're all human. We'll always be human until we go up to heaven, you know. So, pride is saying, I don't need to pray, you know, and, and if that mentality, you'll so easily fall back into the same things that you've always fallen into. And this vicious cycle, I'll never, I'll never change, I'll never change. Well, have you tried to pray? Have you tried consistent prayer? Maybe you, maybe you pray on Sundays. Maybe you pray, you know, in a crisis. Maybe you pray, you know, five minutes before church. But have you actually, can you honestly say that I have prayed consistently, maybe not one hour, 30 minutes, 15 minutes. Have I consistently prayed? You know, I think one hour is a great number, but maybe it's not the number that you, you choose. You know, maybe 15 minutes, but is it consistent? You know, if it's every now and then, that may be your issue. But there's something to be said about an everyday thing, a consistent thing. Number two, get the word of God in your heart. Study, read. I used to overthink this so much, but like, because I would, I would go on YouTube and I just watch like Brother Stone King, Brother Cisco, Brother Cole. And man, I'd be like, these guys are so smart. What's the point of me studying? Because everything that's been preached has been preached. You know, but that wasn't the point anyway. The point is that I know God, not that I have something to preach. But more than anything, it was like, I just overthought it. Um, you know, I, I'd read the King James Version. Sometimes it was hard to understand. So I just got another version, NLT. It helped me to read it. So just, just don't overthink, you know, studying. I know there's an eternal amount of things that you can pull out of the word of God. That, the point is, you know, you can study till you die and you'll, be pulling things out of the word of God, just new things, new revelations. You know, don't, don't do it to get a new revelation. I'm speaking from experience. Do it because, you know, you love God. You just want to know more of God. And if it's the same story, if it's, the, if it's Noah's flood over and over again, then it's Noah's flood. You know, there's, there's a thousand things to be said about Noah's flood, a thousand messages in there, and things that God could speak to. And another thing is, I'll just share a quick testimony. There was a time where, um, I would just say it was back in 2018, I went to Pastor Ball and I said, man, I don't know what's going on, but I just feel like so vulnerable. I don't know. I didn't know how to like what word to describe my feeling. And he told me, he's like, it's a test. He's like, when's the last time you read, read your Bible? And I was like, oh, that's a good, that's a good point. And so I started getting in the word of God. It's not that I didn't know the word of God. I didn't re ever read it. It was just for a season. And he was just telling me, he's like, man, this is a test. He's like, you need to get in the word of God. And so um, I really, the issue was, is I felt God wasn't speaking to me. And I was like, why isn't God speaking to me any anymore? I feel abandoned. And it was like, well, when's the last time you got in the Bible? And so what I'm saying is, yes, God speaks. Sometimes God speaks audibly. Sometimes God speaks through a dream. Sometimes he speaks through a whisper. But never forget that one of the main sources God will speak to you is through the Bible. You know, and so sometimes, like, I, watch, I went to Urshan College, and um, it was kind of a common thing amongst us young guys were like, we got so desirous for the gifts of the spirit. We really wanted God. We wanted like some angel to come by us and be like, you know, say something just huge, like the next president of the United States will be, and then there it is, you know. But the fact of the matter is, it's like, you know, sure, some guys live at that level, but it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. 
Maybe that's for you, but it has to start somewhere. You know what I mean? And you, you have to get in the Bible. That's how God begins to speak to you. That's, that's where you submit all your ideas and concepts to. Um, I know some people that, man, they've, they've been left alone um, without any, and that's actually my next point, is submitting to your pastor. You know, they've been left alone on the, on the opposite side. They've been left alone with their Bible, and they come up with all these crazy ideas that are not even in the Bible, and they'll begin to preach things that are false. You know, that's why I believe God has also given us a pastor, has given me a pastor, or you a pastor, so we can talk to them and we can submit under them, and God will honor that. Number four, I'm getting to the end here. Um, musicians, you can come up or whatever is next. Um, number four, fast. One day a week. You know, I literally, I do not like fasting at all. I love food. I actually just got my cholesterol checked, and it's horrible. So I need to stop eating steaks. So I, I don't like fasting, but one day a week, it's, it's just great. And, and one time I did a fast. It was pretty long. And I was kind of disappointed because I wanted, like, again, I wanted, like, an angel to visit me or something. And at the end of the, like, the, like it was so long, dude. It's, like, it's, it's 14 days. At the end of the 14 days... All I heard was, trust me. I'm like, are you serious? I was so upset. I was like, trust you? Are you serious? I was like, I'm going to get a burrito, man. I was like, this isn't worth my time. So fast one, one day a week. So uh, it, it'll, it'll definitely improve, uh, improve your spiritual walk with God, even if you're not getting some major results out of it. I think I, I feel that tonight is, is, you know, keep praying, keep fasting, even though you don't see results. It's not always about the results. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about knowing God. It's about having a relationship with him. And a lot of people say, well, that doesn't make sense because he's not here in the flesh and I can't talk to him. He doesn't respond to me. And I really, I really like talkers. I'm friends with talkers. I'm friends with people that show facial expressions and have emotion or whatever. And he just doesn't do that because he's not a human. I know that's, that's tough. But that's why God gave us 66 books of the Bible that we can read every day so we can know him. In fact, there was one guy a couple years ago um, he, I went to the, I was, I had a friend, I went to her family's party, it was a girl I was dating at the time, and it was like her extended family, and, uh, they knew that I was like Christian, you know, preach, preach the gospel, and there was this, uh, one family member she had there that was like hardcore atheist, like he had an atheist website, and he knew that I was coming, so he was ready, man, he was like ready to just sock me right in the face, and so I get there, and like, then he asked me, he's like, Hey, man, you know, he's like, he showed me his website. I was like, yeah, that's cool, whatever. And then he's like, so let me ask you a question. I was like, yeah. And he goes, why doesn't God just come out of the sky with his big booming voice and tell us exactly what we need to do to be saved or what we need to do? And I was like, honestly, very disrespectful. And I, and dude, like, I did not stutter. I don't know what came over me. Genuine, I felt it was the Holy Ghost. But I, I, I literally said, I said, he gave you 66 books of the Bible and walked on this earth for 33 and a half years. What more do you want? You know what I mean? What, what more? What more? And I understand. I, I really do understand. I wasn't trying to be rude to him, but I understand. You know, it's hard. He's not here in the flesh. He's not a, you know, manifested physically yet. But he gave us 66 books for a reason, and we ought to read them and study them. And Timothy was told, study. Show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is a way that you can stay free. Last one. Number five, a big thing. Last thing, monitor media consumption. Take off the app store, make your phone a brick, do whatever you have to do. But this is one of a recent, this is a recent thing for me that I just kind of came through where like I could not control my media consumption. It was like, the, you know, I'm not going to be one of these preachers that tells you to delete Instagram or Facebook. You know, pastor tells our congregation, he uses it to talk to missionaries. You know, it's useful in a lot of ways. But if you can't control yourself and you can't control your consumption, then it's just better to take it off. If it means your salvation, if it means your liberty in Christ, if it means your freedom, dude, make your phone a brick. Do what you have to do. And so, like, my phone, that thing is a brick. I cannot do anything on that but call and text. And just because, like, I genuinely, like, would scroll, like, all the time. And I just genuinely, it was just horrible. But TV and social media is just enough to distract us from our chains, it's, it's long enough to where we feel like they aren't there anymore. It feels like freedom, but it's not before long until something starts getting heavy again. And we have to keep distracting ourselves. You can stand with me tonight. Let me, let me ask you, how does that sound like freedom? 
I'm not against using social media for the right purposes, but if it has become a way for you to desensitize yourself from bondage, then you've just multiplied your problems. So don't become desensitized to bondage. Submit yourself under the hand of God. Pray, fast, study the word of God, and God will reveal things. We're all susceptible. It doesn't make you less of a person. It doesn't make you less of a man of God, a woman of God, a child of God. We're all susceptible to some things because we're human. But staying in prayer, staying in the word of God, what does the Bible say? It says looking in the perfect law of what? Of liberty. And actually in that context, in those verses, he was talking, James was talking about those who literally look in a mirror they see they, who they are and what they are, and God tells them the things that they need to fix. And after they've looked in the mirror, they just walk away, and they forget everything that God said. So, so don't look into the perfect law of liberty and so quickly walk away and forget where God has brought you from. Amen. That is one of the ways you'll stay free. If you lift your hands with me. Jesus, I thank you for this word that you've brought tonight. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that anybody under the sound of my voice that needs deliverance, I pray in the name of Jesus you would deliver them from everything, every emotional thing, every mental thing, every physical thing in the name of Jesus, every spiritual thing that is not of God. We rebuke, we bind in the name of Jesus. And God, we loose the liberating power. I want you to help me pray for a moment. We loose the liberating power of the Holy Ghost in this house in the name of Jesus. The Bible says to bind, and then it also says to loose. So right now, I'm just binding anything that will bring bondage to your life, that will trip you up, that is seeking to keep you bound in what you once were. God, I pray that we'd be people of the Word of God, people of prayer. God, that we stayed submitted to you, O oh God. That we would not look into the perfect law of liberty and walk away so easily forgetting who we once were, oh God. The things that you've told us to fix, the things that you've whispered to us to work on, God, I pray you'd begin to reveal that to us. God, let us not so easily walk away and just forget. God, help us to stay free. Help us to stay in the liberty that you have given us, oh God. In Jesus' name. Would you continue to pray and worship the Lord for a moment? Break through the pride, break through the shame, and I've had enough of staying the same. Break through the fear and open the gates, because I'm getting tired of playing it safe. If you feel like God's tugging at your heart, come to this altar right now in the name of Jesus. Open up your heart to the Lord right now. Come on, if you don't feel like this is for you, that's all right. Why don't you lay your hand on somebody next to you and just pray for him. God is wanting to totally and completely deliver you from everything, depression, anxiety, fear. It may not be sin. It may not be addiction. It may be some mental thing. It may be some emotional thing you've been struggling with. God says today, daughter, son, I want to deliver you completely and totally where you can walk away from this and be a new creature. You can be something, you can be something new. Hallelujah. Come on, I know we got fireworks. I know we got food after this. I don't want to mess up any program here tonight. But I'm coming to tell you what the Holy Ghost told me to tell you. That is that he is wanting to completely and totally deliver you from everything that you thought you could never get victory over. The thing that you say to yourself, it's always going to be like this. I'm always going to walk around this mountain. I'm always going to be in this valley. God says, no, no. Today is the day that I'm setting you free. Today is the day where your chains are going to come off, where you're going to look back five months, five years from now and say, that's a testimony. That's something I can talk about. Come on, I feel ready.
restoration right now. Come on, there's things that you may have lost. There's things that you feel that have been lost just because of life, just because of some poor decisions. Maybe some things you thought you could have done differently. Come on, God says, I'm a, I'm a restoring God. I'm a delivering God. to me the joy of my salvation Woo. In Jesus name come on come on come on hallelujah you got a breakthrough tonight do you need a breakthrough tonight do you need a breakthrough tonight just push through hallelujah